a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to the Back to the Bible radio program. This is Brent Arnold, the preacher for the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to study God's Word with you this morning. Now, let us open God's Word together as we go back to the Bible. Today, we're going to continue our series on having a marriage that is love song worthy. This is the second lesson in this series, and if you would like to have a recording of the first lesson, just email us at greenfieldchurchofchrist at yahoo.com or call us at 731-235-2341, and we'd be more than happy to get that out to you uh, as soon as possible for no charge whatsoever. What we're studying about here is about how God's Word can lead us not only to have marriages that will survive the test of time, but marriages that will be loving, healthy, happy, and strong. We're about, we're studying about learning how to be a helpmeet. That's what God intended for us to be when we became a husband or we became a wife. And being a helpmeet means that you are committed to doing all that you can do to meet the needs, physical, spiritual, and emotional, of your spouse. Now, one of the greatest challenges for us in meeting the needs of our spouse is simply knowing what those needs are. We're so different in so many ways that sometimes it's a challenge for us to even understand our spouse's needs, much less to meet them. That's what this study is all about, is studying those things that will help us to understand and meet those needs. I want to recommend a couple of books that have been very helpful to me uh, in my own marriage and in the preparation of these, these lessons. Uh, one is a book by the name of The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. In that book, Mr. Chapman describes our emotional needs as the language with which love is spoken to us. And he points out how being sincere in marriage is often not enough to have a happy marriage. A marriage may survive, but not be fulfilling as it should be and could be. That if if our marriages would be satisfying, we must communicate love in the way which speaks the clearest to our spouse. And he says that there are primarily five love languages, and they are words of affirmation, quality time, the receiving of gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. And, and, and he says that all of us have pr- more than likely at least one of these, maybe another, as our primary love language. And then what someone do, does these things for us, we feel love, we feel full. But if we are having to live without these things, we will feel empty and, uh, and uh, abandoned. These languages apply to marriage. They apply to the raising of our children. They apply to all of our relationships, really. And as people speak different languages, so love is communicated in different ways to different people. And um, as one language is usually most comfortable to us, love is generally, generally communicated the strongest in one particular area. And if I want to learn to communicate love to my spouse, then it's about learning her language or his language and learning how to communicate it proficiently. It can be awkward at first to learn a new language, especially when in all likelihood her language or his language is going to be different from mine. But it can get easier with practice. And it will be impossible to fill our spouse's heart with love when we're speaking in a language that doesn't communicate to them. Another book that I want to recommend is the book His Needs, Her Needs by Willard Harley. Mr. Harley describes the relationship of husbands and wives with the concept of a love bank. 
And when you meet your spouse's needs, you make deposits into their love bank. And the greater the need is to them, the greater the deposit will be when you meet it. But when we neglect our spouse's needs, or we hurt them in some way, then we make withdrawals from that love bank. And our goal, of course, is to make as many deposits as we can by learning and meeting each other's needs and avoiding withdrawals as much as we possibly can. Mr. Harley has rated what his experience in doing marriage counseling has shown are the most important needs for every wife. He says that they are in order. She needs affection. She needs conversation. She needs uh, honesty. She needs financial support. And she needs a family commitment from her husband. Mr. Harley also rated what he says are the most important needs for every husband. And in order, he says they are sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, an attractive spouse, domestic support, and admiration. Now, I don't know that I agree with every conclusion that these men have drawn. And I don't know that there are hard, fast rules that apply to all marriages. But there are some principles there at work that I believe we can learn from and benefit from. Now, there's one final book that I want to really, truly recommend to you. And even if you don't read the other two books, you have to read this one, okay? And that book is The Song of Solomon. This biblical book explains marriage to us in a way that really and truly no other can. And I think really that the reason the principles of these other two books work is because they're in agreement with the principles that were stated hundreds of years ago in the Song of Solomon. The Bible does not shy away from any topic that is important to our existence. God created marriage to be a blessing for all of us, a way for our emotional, sexual, physical needs to be met and fulfilled. All of these things are God's ideas, and he alone can guide us to show us the best way to apply them. Some religions have tried to present the sexual relationship as somewhat unspiritual, As you think about the uh, priesthood within Catholicism, there's this concept that people that uh, are more spiritual do not engage in sexual relations. But that is not a biblical concept. Others take a more carnal approach and look upon the sexual relationship as nothing more than satisfying physical desires. But even that is not God's position on the matter either. God sees the sexual relationship as an expression of the union between two people who love each other with the love of God. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers, fornicators, and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews 13, 4. God's word, my friend, I promise you, can guide us to a marriage that will not only leave us fulfilled, but lift us up closer to him. We've all heard love songs on the radio. There are plenty of them. But the love song that is contained in the Song of Solomon is a real love story between Solomon and his bride. Most couples have a song. Maybe it was a song that was uh, on the radio a lot when you first started dating. And and, and sometimes you can hear a a love song and it can take you back to a moment when you were there with someone that you, you felt very, very dear to and cared about very much. I fear that a lot of husbands and wives feel today that their marriage isn't worth writing a love song about. But it can be, my friend. It can be. Now, I must warn you. 
The Bible is the original no-spin zone. And it doesn't dress things up for us. We get to see their relationship, warts and all. And uh, it will take us into some of their most intimate conversations and moments. And I think that we will see in these situations some of our own personal dealings as married couples. Now, some of that may be uncomfortable for us. Some of us may get our toes stepped on. Something may be brought out, brought out that we're doing wrong. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you, my friend. This happens to all of us. There's never been such a thing as a perfect marriage. There's no such thing as a perfect husband. There's no such thing as a perfect wife. So if you have it in your head that that's what you have to be, just erase that notion right now. And I want you to approach this study with an open mind, an open heart, and a willingness to grow, a willingness to do things differently, a willingness to try something new, to do it because you're putting the one that you love first. They're worth it to you. 1 Kings 4.32 tells us that Solomon wrote a total of 1,005 songs. But from that large field, this one that we're studying was his chart topper. It was his all-time greatest hit. And that's why Song of Solomon 1.1 calls this Solomon's Song of Songs, the song of all songs. It was his ultimate. And I believe it will be just as near and dear to you after we study it as it was to him. There's a question about this book as to whether or not it should be interpreted figuratively or literally. Some believe that it is not so much a a literal description of the relationship between a husband and his wife as much as it is a metaphorical um, discussion of the relationship between God and the nation of Israel or between Christ and his church. But there's really nothing about the language of the book that would suggest. It's a very poetic book, But there's nothing in it like the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel that would suggest that it was meant to be apocalyptic language or figurative language or to be taken as a parable or any of those kind of things. The language of the book addresses the situation in a very straightforward way, just as though it was meant to be taken literally. Now, there's a lot of overlapping here. A lot of the principles of this book do apply to those situations. But I always try to look at a book as it would have related to its original audience. And these ideas about Christ and the church and and all of that would have been lost on Solomon's original audience. They would have taken this book at face value. And I don't see any reason why we can't do the same. Now, some of you who have some familiarity with Solomon may be wondering, why in the world would Solomon be chosen to contribute to the Bible a book about marriage? Isn't this this the same king who, who later on in his life had 700 wives and 300 mistresses? Well, the answer is yes, it is the same man. But earlier in his life, Solomon had been blessed with heavenly wisdom. And I believe he was sincere in applying that wisdom to his life and to his marriage in the beginning. And I believe he wrote this book as things were when they were following the ideal course. And of course, he wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and that's what matters most, and that's why we study this book. Now, later on in his life, unfortunately, it seems that he did not apply this wisdom. But that doesn't detract from its usefulness. The ideal world met the real world. You know, 
Uh, David's adultery with Bathsheba doesn't detract from his victory over Goliath. And we can still learn from Solomon, even if we are learning from his mistake. In marriage, we are constantly setting our sights on the ideal world. And that's what this book is. Marriage as it would be ideally. Now we know that we live in the real world. And it's not always easy to rein in the ideal world when you're living in the real world. It's not easy, but it's worth it. And that's the challenge. This is a challenge that we face in lots of other areas of our lives. We, as Christians, strive to live like we are, like our citizenship is in heaven, even though right now our feet are planted on the earth. And there's always this conflict between those two realities. And so it will be in our marriages. There's the ideal world of marriage. There's the real world of marriage. And these two are going to try to conflict with each other. But that doesn't mean that we should not continue to strive for the ideal world. Because the reality is we will get much closer to it than we can even imagine with God's help. Today, let's focus the first part of this study, uh, this first, first lesson here with what time we have left today on one of the needs that this book addresses. I said that Mr. Williard Harley recognizes how important communication is, especially to a wife. I also said that Mr. Chapman recognized that words of affirmation are a powerful love language for many people. Now, I have to be bluntly honest with you. I'm a man. And sometimes uh, I'm slow, okay? I'm willing to admit it. I remember when my wife and I were first married, and during those first few years, I would I read some books that talked about marriage, especially those that had a biblical um um, foundation for them. And I must admit, there were many times when I skipped the chapters that talked about communication. You know, there's a saying that men are from Mars and women are from Venus, and they, they see things differently, they understand things differently, they value things differently, and, and typically it's more of a challenge for men to see the importance of communication and, and work at communicating more effectively. I have since learned the error of my ways, and while I still have a long way to go in learning how to communicate effectively, I'm now seeing the benefits, the blessings of being willing to put forth the effort to try to learn how. Communication that is healthy, positive, and loving is something that is certainly emphasized in the Song of Solomon. There's a poem that says to keep your marriage brimming with love and the loving cup. When you, whenever you're wrong, admit it. And whenever you're right, shut up. <laughs> well, there's a lot of truth to that. And communication, effective communication, is sometimes as much about knowing when not to speak as it is about knowing when to speak. Solomon and his bride were drawn to each other by the encouraging words that they shared with one another. I want to point out a few things this morning about the manner in which they communicated with each other. First of all, their words were plentiful. They talked a lot. In fact, about 60% of the book, Song of Solomon, are conversations between them. Communication is the music of marriage. But communication is not just about talking. You can be a, 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 a powerful talker without being a great communicator. Because communication demands speaking and listening. So if you want to be a good communicator, it's not only about expressing yourself and finding the voice to express yourself in a kind and forthright way, 
but it's also about learning to be a good listener and take in, process, and adjust to what someone else is saying to you. You know, we are really, truly so different. And because of that, we really cannot read each other's minds. We may expect each other to. We may expect that the other person should be able to guess what we're feeling or know what we're feeling or know what we want or know what we need, but we really can't do that. And the only way we can bridge the gap between Mars and Venus is to talk to each other and listen to each other, to grant each other enough time. It's so easy for us to get distracted. We're so busy. We have so many things going on. But men, we cannot allow the football game to keep us from listening to the one that God has blessed us with. We have to take that time. We have to make space in our schedule to devote to this one that we love. Peter said that husbands are to dwell with with their wives in an understanding way, 1 Peter 3, 7. And the only way we can achieve that understanding is to express ourselves and listen to each other. James 1.19 says that every man ought to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Someone has observed that God gave us two ears and one mouth to remind us that we should listen twice as much and speak half as much. There may be some truth to that, especially as it applies to marriage. When we listen to our spouse, we cannot allow interruptions. We must give them our full and undivided attention because their thoughts, their feelings, their needs, their desires are the most important thing to us in this world. God only takes a seat higher than they do. And we need to be sensitive to the other person's need to speak and express themselves. We need to listen without judgment. We need to listen without interruption. We may not always agree, but that doesn't mean that we have to attack our spouse when we do disagree. We can listen in an understanding way, even when we don't agree. And we can be willing to adjust where we can and compromise, even though we may see things differently. It's a challenge to keep two people on the same page. It's not easy. And we may find that the longer we allow a disconnection, the greater number of pages that separate us. We may soon find ourselves not even in the same book. Solomon and his bride took time to talk to each other. You know how important it is for us to do that as well. Another thing that I notice about their words is that they were personal. Sometimes it can be a challenge to know who is speaking in the Song of Solomon. But one way you can know is by recognizing that he calls her my love and she calls him my beloved. In other words, it seems as though they had pet names for each other. Instead of calling her by her name, he called her my love and vice versa. Now, not all people do this. You may not have a a nickname for your spouse. Some folks give their spouses nicknames that they don't appreciate. And if that's the case, they, they need to get rid of that habit right away. Those words will not only not build up, but they can destroy. But these two did have pet names. Pet names that they had chosen to make sure that every time they addressed their spouse, they were relaying this message. I care about you. Every time he called her my love, she knew he cared about her. Every time she called him my beloved, he knew she cared about him. They made sure that they communicated that to each other every day. Every day. My children called their grandmother on my wife's side, honey. Now, that may sound strange to to some of you, but I don't think it will when you find out why they do that. My oldest son, Jacob, spent the night with his uh, papa and, and honey when he was just a little boy. 
He was old enough to talk, but just barely old enough to talk. And while he was there, he kept hearing Papa call his grandmother, Honey. Honey, would you mind getting me a glass of tea? Or, Honey, ha ha have you seen uh, this book? Or, or, or what? You know, whatever the case may be. He kept hearing her, hearing him calling her Honey. He thought that was her name. So he started calling her Honey, too. And it just stuck until now all of her grandchildren call her Honey. What an impression. I, I'm so thankful for, for that impression that was made upon my son. A man that he looks up to like he looks up to his papa. That he hears him not embarrassed, not ashamed to express how he feels about his wife. A young boy needs to have that impression made upon him. These names were expressions of their love. And they did not mind if others knew how they felt about each other. Some may not feel comfortable advertising that. I remember in the movie, Remember the Titan, Titans, there's a scene in which the boys are calling back home while they're away at football camp, and one of them is talking to his girlfriend, and there's a long line of boys waiting to use the telephone. And she's on the other line saying, Tell me that you love me. Tell me that you love me. And he doesn't want to do it. But finally he gives in. He says, I love you, sugar. And as soon as he does, all of the boys in line roar with laughter and in instantly begin to make fun of him. Some of us don't feel comfortable doing that. It's, it's naturally unusual for some of us to engage in this. But just think of the impression that you can make on your loved one's heart when you demonstrate that you don't care if others make fun of you. You don't care how uncomfortable it may be at first. You want to work on it until it becomes comfortable because you want them to know how you feel about them. I heard a story about a man who told his young wife, he said, now listen, I told you on the day that we married, I love you. And if I ever change your, my mind, I'll let you know. Some would reason, well, I, I go to work, I, I provide a living, or, or some would say, I, I cook the meals and I wash the clothes. What more do I have to do to demonstrate that I love this person? I understand that. And actions do speak louder than words. That's true too. But I can tell you this, there's no substitute for telling your spouse on a regular basis how you feel about them. Making sure you know how important they are to you. And letting them hear from your lips on a regular basis, I love you and wouldn't want to live my life without you. A marriage that has that going on regularly is well on its way to being a marriage that will be strong healthy, and happy. That's all the time that we have this morning, my friend. I hope that you'll tune in again and we'll continue to study more about the communication that must exist in marriage and, and also talk about other needs that we should be striving to meet. But my friend, if there's any way that we can help you, we would urge you, please, contact us today. My word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my path. Again, this has been Brent Arnold from the Greenfield Church of Christ. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope and pray that this lesson has been a blessing to you. And we hope that you'll tune in again next week to this same station at this same time. Please come and visit us as soon as you can. We're located on Highway 45 in Greenfield, Tennessee. We meet on Sundays at 10, 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. We also meet on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. You can contact us either by calling us at 731-235-2341 or by emailing us at greenfieldchurchofchrist at yahoo.com. We'll be looking forward to our next opportunity to go back to the Bible. Till then, have a great day.